Hey, good morning. Thank you to our live audience for being here. Just give it up for yourselves. A lot of excitement. I like it. And then everyone watching, so since I can't hear them, I'm going to ask that you pretend that you are them. And would you give it up for everyone watching online at, their, at our homes and all across the city? So good to be here. Kind of like what Jason said earlier, it's okay to talk back. It's okay to let me know if you like something. If you don't like it today, that's fine. Just email me later. I get a lot of those on Monday, but I like hearing it. Hey, take out your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. We'll get there in just one second. If you've been a part of LifeGate for one day or since day one, you know that we are not here to give you our opinions. That's certainly what not, I'm not here to do, but to unpack the Word of God. That's what we do. We unpack the Scriptures together. So I want to look at our Scripture again. Once again, the story of a man named Zacchaeus found in Luke, chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. And we are in sort of the final week of our series, The Place We Find Ourselves. And what is the place we find ourselves? We find ourselves in the unique position of a church that's not even six years old who came to the city and we were told repeatedly that it would not work. You start a church in Denver, it will not work. It'll die. And we've known churches that have died over these past six years. And it grieves our hearts. It grieves us when a church of anywhere dies. And yet God has been good to us. And so we find ourselves in the place, in the financial position, in the relational position, in the spiritual position to stake a claim in the city of Denver and to say, hey, we're here to stay. We're not renting anymore. We're owning. We're building a kingdom outpost. We are planting a little plot of heaven here on earth. And so I'm excited to be a part of the series and what God is doing. And and my hope is that we would together as the people of God, listen, more than anything, what I care about for you today, more than anything else, is that you encounter the living Jesus. That you encounter the living, resurrected Jesus in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. And I believe when you encounter Jesus, everything in your life changes. And this is the story of Zacchaeus. You see in the life of this man, someone who is so far from God, meet Jesus. And in that moment, you see that if it's it's available for Zacchaeus, it's available for us. We see Zacchaeus meets Jesus and he encounters freedom. And then we saw last week how Zacchaeus meets Jesus and he encounters faith and generosity is unlocked in the life of Zacchaeus. And today, what I want to talk to you about in the scriptures, in the story of Zacchaeus meeting Jesus is what it looks like to find joy, true, eternal, lasting joy. And in 2020, a year marked by loss, global pandemic, lockdowns, social distancing. People have lost family members. You've lost jobs, careers, dreams, relationships, ambitions. 2020 is marked by the loss of a lot of things, but could it be possible that joy is still available for you in and through Jesus? And I believe that it is. And this is why the church exists, not just our church, but this is why the church exists. The church exists to be in the city to remind the people of the good news of the gospel, good news of great joy, for unto you today is born in the city of David, Jesus the Messiah, who is the giver of all good things, the giver of joy. And my hope is that we become the kind of church that leaves a lasting legacy of joy in our lives, in our families, in the city. Wherever we go, we leave joy wherever we go. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. So let's look at the scriptures together. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Let's read this together. And there's a couple things I'm going to have you highlight or circle. He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the loss. Lord Jesus, in these next few moments, would your presence be here? Would you renew us? Would you restore us? 
in joy that we might respond in the fullness of who you are. We love you. And in one loud resounding voice, all of God's people here and watching all together said, amen and amen. I love stories. In fact, I believe whoever tells the better story shapes the culture. But story is all about perspective. Whatever perspective you tell a story from or you hear a story from shapes the way in which you hear and receive that story. So think of something like Star Wars. That's a particular story told from the perspective of the rebellion. Now that's a different story or maybe a different side of the story if it's being told by the empire. Stories have different perspectives. When I was in high school, one of my greatest moments of my life me and my friend Steve are driving up 94 in Chicago in a really cool white VW bug. There we are, two of us, just hanging out in a car, and we're driving north, and as we're driving, Steve is driving, I'm in the passenger side, and I look out the window, and what do I see? I see a beautiful red Ferrari. I mean, just gorgeous. Top is down, and he is right next to us. And inside that Ferrari, driving said Ferrari is none other than the goat himself. Michael Jordan is in the car six feet away from us. We were social distancing before it was a thing. He was six feet away from me. And he had his Kangol hat on. He had a cigar in his mouth. He had one hand on the steering wheel. And he's driving. And so I'm, I'm losing my mind at this point. I am going nuts. I am pounding on the window. My friend Steve is like, roll the window down. Roll the window down. Roll the window down. So we roll it down. And I utter the only words I can think of. Michael, Michael, Mike, just over and over and over and over again. And he looks at us. He looks at both of us. So he has, I mean, he is just stone cold killer. He has not, I mean, not flinched at all. He looks at us, looks over, and he gives us the old wink in the gun. Now, in my mind, this meant, hey, I'm inviting you guys over to my house. You should follow me. That's what I thought he meant. So I'm like, Steve, he, he said, follow him, follow him. So we, we chase, I mean, this is a VW bug, turbo, but we're following him in a Ferrari. And so we fly out, we exit on Half Day Road, because that's where he lives. We exit on Half Day Road. We come to a red light and it stops. As soon as the light goes red, Jordan goes through. And so we're stuck at this red light. From my perspective, from our perspective of the story, we were being invited to hang out for a nice evening and maybe play some basketball, give us a tour around the house. Like we were friends. That's what my perspective was. From his perspective, I wonder what the story would have been. That two crazy Asian kids were in a white VW bug chasing him down and he has no idea what we're about to do and he was trying to escape. The story, you need both sides to really get a picture of what's happening here. When you read the Bible and you find the stories in the Bible, you want to look through the perspective of who's telling the story and what might that person be perceiving about what's happening here. The story of Zacchaeus could be told from a few different perspectives. It could be told from the perspective of Zacchaeus and you would get one aspect or one side of the story. It could be told from the perspective of Jesus. It could be told from the perspective of the disciples. But as I read the story of Zacchaeus, what I always come to is the perspective of the crowd. The skeptical crowd, the curious crowd watching this story unfold. So the crowd must have been shocked when Jesus stops at the tree and he looks up at Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus was no anonymous man. He was well known in the city of Jericho and he was well hated in the city of Jericho. The one thing the people had in common was they hated the Romans and they hated Zacchaeus who was collecting the taxes for the Romans to oppress him. So they must have been shocked when Jesus stops at the tree and Jesus invites Zacchaeus down and he's going to go to Zacchaeus' house and they say, well, no, Jesus, don't, don't you mean to condemn him at this point? Do you know who this man is? Do you know what he has done? Do you know what he is currently doing? See, a lot of the times it actually shocks us when Jesus extends grace to people we think don't deserve it. And Jesus stops. And this would have been confusing for the crowd. Why would he stop and talk to Zacchaeus? Because see, the crowd knows about Zacchaeus, but they don't really know Zacchaeus. They know he's powerful. They know he has a lot of clout with the Roman elite. He's very political. 
They know that he is filthy rich and they know that he's hated. That's really the extent of what they know about Zacchaeus. What they don't know is that Zacchaeus has a career, but he doesn't have a calling. He has a name, but he has no identity. He has a whole lot of money, but no peace at all. He has a lot of acquaintances, but no real intimacy. He has a place where he lives, but no real purpose for his life. They know about him, but they don't know him. They don't know that Zacchaeus, in one word, is bankrupt. A life filled with stuff, a whole lot of stuff. Zacchaeus could get the best and the baddest of everything that he wanted, but he's still bankrupt. There's not one ounce of joy in this man's life. Not one. Which is why I think, this is pure conjecture, but this is why I think Zacchaeus runs to see Jesus. I think maybe Zacchaeus heard a rumor that years ago, Jesus began his first message by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus isn't talking about financially poor. poor. He's saying those who are bankrupt before me. Jesus says the blessing in your life begins, joy begins when you are willing to admit that you are bankrupt before God. You have nothing to offer him at all. Zacchaeus knows he's bankrupt. He has no joy at all in his life. He looks like he has joy, but he has none. Several years ago, my wife and I were at this restaurant in Indiana, sort of a home restaurant in the middle of nowhere. And part of what they do in the restaurant, just sort of their thing, is they all show up together, all the waitresses and waiters, they show up at your table and they start singing a very traditional song. If you've grown up in the church, maybe you know this. If you haven't, it's okay. I'm going to teach you a very traditional song that we sang as little kids. And they sang the song and it goes a little bit something like this. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. All right, let's do it with a little bit more enthusiasm, a little more feel, get everything you got in it. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? But except they sang it like this. They all stood there, hands like this, around our table. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. And I thought to myself, If that's the day where you're joyful, what do you like on a bad day? What do you like when you're really suffering? And I think many of us are like that. On the external, life is good, life is great, life is amazing. But if we were to actually sing with what's happening in our soul, it would sound more like, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? And yet, Zacchaeus meets Jesus at the place, the tree. Jesus says, hurry up and come down. Not just come down, hurry up and come down. Now, a sycamore tree would not be a very easy tree to climb. It's a difficult tree to climb. So one, Zacchaeus is short. Two, it's a difficult tree to climb. He made it all the way up the tree, took him all day, and now Jesus is saying, I want you to come back down quickly. And Zacchaeus, it says, he hurries down and receives him joyfully. The word in the Greek there doesn't mean happy and giddy. The word means that he leaned into God's grace. He was leaning into God's favor. For the first time in Zacchaeus' known life, he experienced the grace of God and he runs down because grace has never tasted so good. And he runs down, he receives him joyfully. And then you see Zacchaeus living out this life of joy. The crowd would have been skeptical. The crowd sitting around the house watching the story unfold. Zacchaeus stands up and he says, Lord, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I pay them back fourfold and half of my goods I give to the poor. Now the crowd is shocked by this. Listen, this is a man who robbed them violently. Essentially, he was the head of the mafia in Jericho. Think of the most violent, oppressive person you know who one day stands up and says, if I've defrauded anyone, which is I've defrauded everyone, I'm going to pay them back fourfold and I'm going to restore everything, half of what I have back to the poor. I think we would be skeptical too. I think we are skeptical, aren't we? When that one friend we have who's been walking so far from God when the one person we have in our life who we repeatedly are praying that they meet Jesus and when they finally do, we're skeptical about if, well, is this real? Let me see if this is real. 
But then the next day, Zacchaeus is going door to door and he's handing out money to the poor. Now, there was no 501c3 where he could just write a check and say, okay, you guys go do it. To give to the poor meant he had to actually go to where the poor were. And so he goes to the poor and then he says, if I've defrauded anyone, now his crimes were financial. Zacchaeus knew exactly who he took money from. He looked at every single family and he knew I took this much from him, this much from her, this much from this business. So he goes down the list. I've defrauded you this much. Here's four times. I've defrauded you this much. Here's four times. I've defrauded you this time. Four months. Now the crowd must have been skeptical and shocked at this. How is this unfolding? How does this man, this guy, this wicked, evil, hated man, how does he go from a sinner to a saint? How does he go from a bully to being a brother? How does he go from a violent oppressor to be the one who is extending and distributing joy in the streets of Jericho. How is this possible? They must have thought to themselves, it's almost as if he had a genetic DNA transplant. Something in the core of who he was shifted. He wasn't a better version of himself. He was new. See, we often think that the gospel has come to just make you a better version of yourself. Take all the parts of yourself you don't like and then God will just make that part better. But this is not the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come to transform all of you. There's a lie that is going around in the church. And if you've been here for long enough, you'll hear me say this a lot. There's a lie going around in the church of today. And the lie goes a little bit something like this. God accepts you as you are. That's actually not true. If God accepted you as you were, there would be no reason for Jesus. Poor Jesus died for nothing. The reality is God loves you as you are. Not as you should be, not as you could be, not as you must be. God loves you as you are. All of the success, all of the ugliness, all of the shame, everything you hide, God loves you as you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you the way he found you. Zacchaeus had some sort of genetic transplant going on. He was a new person. His DNA, if you will, had changed. What happened in the life of Zacchaeus, who was marked and known as a man who was a sinner? After all, that was the criticism. He's going into the home of a man who is a sinner. Now, what is it to be a sinner? Being a sinner doesn't mean you make bad choices or that you're even a bad person. Sinning is to rebel against the standard by which God has set for us to live. God has given us a standard by which to live. In the Old Testament, it was the Ten Commandments, the laws. Jesus then took that and he revamped it. He says, you've heard that it is a sin to murder, but I tell you, if you even look at someone else and call them a fool, you've already committed murder in your heart. You've already sinned in your heart. Jesus ups the standard of what it means to live. Essentially, Jesus says, the standard is perfection. And if we rebel against God and push against God, we actually sin. Again, something you hear me say all the time if you go here for long enough is that every command of scripture, every single command, the easy ones, the hard ones, the difficult ones, the confusing ones, every single command of scripture is given by God in this book, given by God to us for joy in our life to increase. God is not in the business of limiting our fun. Now, here's where parents and God are different. Nine out of 10 times, who are we kidding? Maybe five out of 10 times, I want my kids to obey me because it'd be good for them. Five out of 10 times. If you just listen to me, your life would be better. Maybe at nine years old, you haven't figured out all of life yet and I could help you with some stuff, okay? But the other five out of 10 times, if they would obey, it would make my life easier. If you would just go to bed on time, then I could watch the Lakers game in peace. If you would just stop taking a permanent marker and drawing on the walls so I have to clean it later, my life would be better. That's not the way God works. We often think God has these commands so he can control us so his life would be better. God gives us these commands so that our life would be more joyful, more peace, more purpose, more love, more grace, more hope. 
Apart from Christ, the Bible says, we are all sinners. And yet Zacchaeus in this moment experiences the transformative power of God in his life. Now, how can this come to be? The crowd, if they were shocked by Zacchaeus' confession, would have even been more shocked by Jesus' proclamation. Salvation has come to this house today, for he also is a son of Abraham. Now, this seems like sort of an odd proclamation. So you're saved, and uh, you got a new daddy. That kind of sounds kind of weird, right? That's just kind of odd for us. Who is this Abraham character, and what does he have to do with salvation? The advantage that Jesus had that we don't have is Jesus was born into a context where the people he was around knew functionally about God. They knew there was a God, one God whose name was Yahweh or Elohim. And this God had chosen a man named Abraham who's from the Ur of the Chaldeans from whom God would bless all nations and create all people. His people would come from Abraham. Abraham was the father of the people of God, and he represented God's promise to his people. I will make a covenant with you, Abraham, that I will be your God, and your people will be my people. And to be in this covenant meant everything. It meant everything to be a part of the people of God. Well, Zacchaeus was not allowed to be the people of God. Though he was Jewish, He was not allowed to be with the people of God because he was such a wicked sinner. So Jesus says, no, 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 no. Zacchaeus, you are also now invited into the promise of God. Every promise that God has for you is now being extended to you. You are now a child of God. You have been adopted into the family of God. You, Zacchaeus, are a new creation. But again, you have to ask the question, how can this be? How can his DNA change? The truth of the Bible is this. Every one of us is born of a seed. And scripture tells us that we are born of a sinful seed because we are born of our parents who inherited the seed of their parents, who inherited the seed of their parents. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Because we come from this lineage of humanity, we are born with a sinful seed. So from birth, from birth, we come out of the womb saying, mine, my kingdom, my way, my, I've never had to teach my kids the word mine. I never sat there and was like, okay, Eli, today we're going to learn a new word. It goes like this. No. Say it with me. No. But Eli, say it with a little more anger. No. I've never, ta- I've never taught my kids to say that. My kids from birth come out of the womb knowing, dad, you work for me, don't you? In fact, my kid is so bossy, sometimes in the car, I'll say, oh, sorry, your majesty. I didn't know I was working for you today. Sorry, your highness, how may I serve you today? I'll say that all the time to my nine year old. Like, Dad, I didn't really read that. I'm like, because you're acting like I work for you. But I don't work for you. We come out of the womb rebelling against God because there is a seed inside of us. Listen, 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 listen. The reason you have anxiety that you got from your mother is because she passed on that seed to you. The reason that you are so angry at life is because a seed has been passed to you from your father. And there's so many in this room right now, many of you watching either are in this category or you know someone in this category, Gen Z, which is most of you, a lot of you in this room are Gen Z. You are the generation that is marked by the most anxiety and the most depression of every generation before you. It was a seed, a corruptible seed that you were born with. And in order for you to walk in the fullness of Jesus, you need a new seed. But here's the thing, you can't do anything to plant a new seed inside of you. You can't go to a store and find that seed and say, if I can just find that seed, I'll put it inside of me and then I'll water it. That's all I'll do, I'll just get a new seed. But you can't do that. You can't put a new seed inside of you. You can't water that seed. You can't even find that seed. And yet Jesus says, there's a genetic transfer that has to happen. Well, the question is, how then do I get that seed? Otherwise, the evil inside of you will always consume you. One of the best books I've read in 2020 is a book by a woman named Edith Eva Egger. The name of the book is called The Choice. And she unpacks her story of a 16, at 16, imagine this, at 16, she was taken to Auschwitz with her sister. Her mother and father were killed instantly. And she tells her story of surviving Auschwitz. 
And she tells in the book, she says, inside of every one of us is either an Adolf Hitler or a Corey Ten Boom. Adolf Hitler, the man who murdered millions of people. 1.3 million people ended up in Auschwitz. Only 100,000 walked out. That doesn't even compare, as wicked as that is, to the six, seven million plus who died because of him. And she says, inside of all of us, that evil is there. But she says there's also a Cory Ten Boom. And who is Cory Ten Boom? Cory Ten Boom was a woman who was not executing Jews. She was hiding Jews in her home, only to be found out and sent to a concentration camp herself. Her sister died in her arms. Years later, Cory Ten Boom meets one of the jailers at that concentration camp who is merciless against her sister, and yet she can hold his hands in her hands and forgive him in the name of Jesus. Inside of all of us is an Adolf Hitler and a Cory Ten Boom. Well, how do I get the seed for that Cory Ten Boom? How do I find that seed? If I can't make it, if I can't find it, if I can't transfer it, if I can't plant it, how do I get that seed? You need a genetic transfer. You need something new. Write this word down. You need something new imprinted inside of you. In John chapter three, Jesus is spending time with his disciples as late in the evening. A man named Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and the ruler of the Jews, comes to see Jesus and he says, Jesus, you must be from God because no one can do these signs unless God is with him. And Jesus, looking at Nicodemus, and the only way that Jesus could do says, Nicodemus, truly, truly, I tell you, that unless one is born again, he can never see the kingdom of God. Now this confuses Nicodemus. What do you mean if I'm born again? Nicodemus is a grown man. So Nicodemus looks at Jesus and he says, do you mean that I should go back into my mother and to be born again? How can I go back into my mother's womb? I've been in the hospital when all three of my children have been born. And I can tell you once they come out, they ain't going back in. So how, how, he's saying, how must I do this? And Jesus says, You must be born of water and born of a seed of the spirit. And what is born of the flesh, what is born of the seed of the flesh will produce flesh, but what is born of the spirit will produce spirit. This is why Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says, in Christ you have within you now an imperishable seed. The doctrine of the conception of Jesus, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, is critical because Jesus was not conceived by the seed of a man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, which means the seed inside of Jesus was incorruptible. He was sinless and flawless in every single way. And the scriptures tell us in Christ, through the purity of the cross and by the power of his resurrection, that seed through the spirit of God has been implanted into you. And now you have a new nature. And that new nature brings the fullness of Christ. And Christ was a man who was always marked by joy. The one thing you never saw in Jesus was a grumpy man. In fact, if you read the Gospels over and over and over again, you'll find that Jesus was never offended. He was never offended. Jesus would never hashtag offended if he was alive today. He just wouldn't do it. And yet in 2020, we're offended by everything. Everything. In fact, I was speaking at a a college one time, got done with my talk, and this girl comes up to me, oddly dressed up as a Pokemon. It was really odd. She comes up to me. And she said, I just wanted you to know that I was offended by what you said. And I was like, well, what did I say? And so she said something, and she's like, so I'm really offended. I was like, oh, well, I'm offended that you're offended. She's like, wait, what? You can't be. I was like, well, I was having a perfectly good day until you told me that I offended you. Now, I'm offended by your offense towards what I offended you with. I'm offended too. She's like, you can't be, okay. And she's walked away. (laughs) Like we're just offended about every single thing, and yet Jesus was a man marked by pure joy. I think that's why children wanted to be around Jesus. Most children do not want to be around grumpy people. My kids have never said like, dad, can you invite him over? He's always grumpy and judgmental. So cool. Can we hang out with him? But they've just never said that. My kids love to be around people that are joyful, that live in the fullness of who God is. And Jesus says this joy, listen to me, in 2020, this joy is available to you. The joy that Bonhoeffer, a man who was arrested, tortured, and murdered by the Nazis, says this joy that is invincible and irrefutable is available to you. And I ask myself, is it? 
does Jesus really make this promise for me? Because I know me. You know you. You know what you've said, what you've done. You know your thoughts. You know what goes through your mind. You know what you've been through. You know what's happened to you. Is this joy really available for me? And Jesus says, yes, right here, right now, the joy that is found in the fullness of who I am is available for you. But it must be imprinted in you. We live in a world of influence. Everybody wants to be an influencer. Everyone I know is like, I'm a social media influencer. You got 14 followers. You're not really an influencer. Like everybody I know wants to be an influencer. I asked my kid the other day, it's like, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he goes, I want to be the best baseball player that has ever played for the Colorado Rockies. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you probably need to spend less time playing Minecraft all day long, like 10 hours a day playing Minecraft, probably not going to help you in that goal. But then he goes, but I have a second dream and it's to be a social media influencer on YouTube. Like my kids name the people they follow. I haven't even heard of these people. Preston, Combo Panda, who are these? I don't know any other who these people are. Everyone I know wants to be an influencer, but here's the problem about influence or being an influencer. It's all short term. It's all short lived. Think about your own life. The things that influenced you years ago doesn't influence you anymore. In fact, just look at what you're wearing. You're wearing what you're wearing because you're influenced by a culture that says wear this. But 10 years from now, it won't be the same. It'll keep changing. It's all short lived. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a boxer. Man, I wanted to be a boxer. I would watch all the Rocky movies. My brother's here to be a witness. He, we watched all the Rockies movies growing up. Bum, 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 bum. I would run down the streets of India, 250 degrees outside. I didn't care. I was running. I was training. I had no fights lined up, nothing, but I was training. I would crack raw eggs and I would drink them straight up. I'm, I'm surprised I don't have salmonella. I didn't die at age 12, but I was so influenced by Rocky. I would stuff pillows in my shirt and have my brother punch me because I was like, I'm going to be the next heavyweight boxing champion of of the world until I woke up one morning and realized I won't be a heavyweight anything. <laughs> like if there was a division in boxing for sickly young girls, I might fit that category, but I was not going to be in heavyweight anything. I'm just not going to fit that category. So then I was like, okay, I need to be influenced by something new. And then one day my brother came home. Cause usually when you're a kid, if you're the middle brother, you're the second brother, you're influenced by what your older brother likes. So whatever he's into, you're into. And he came home one day and he had a tape. Y'all don't even know what a tape is. You can Google it, tape. He brought a tape of the Michael Jackson Thriller album. And we rocked that tape. All the dance moves, you're like, hee hee, we're doing everything. My, my dad would always say like, watching these videos like, gee, what a dirty fellow, always touching himself. That's what my dad would say all the time. But I was so influenced by Michael Jackson. But then those change over time and change over time and change over time. Here's the thing. I think we often look at joy like it can be influenced by what's around us. Like it's a tape I could put in. So if I get a bigger house, I'll get more joy. Better friends, more joy. Better marriage, more joy. More kids, more joy. No kids, more joy. More money, more clothes, nicer this. So we're always perpetually looking for the next short-term thing that will give us the joy that we're looking for. And yet, it never comes. It's always short-lived. Meanwhile, the reason Zacchaeus experiences this joy of Jesus is because Jesus wasn't there to influence him. Jesus was there to imprint him inside of Zacchaeus. Joy is not the result of what's around you. Joy is the condition of what is inside of you. Joy is a condition that must be imprinted. This is why in our year, in our time, I have no inclination or desire to be a church that influences the culture. I could care less about being cool. I could care less about being a culturally influential church. I could absolutely care less. What I want us to be in this place, and if you're here for the first time, if you're watching, know this because this is who we are. I want us to be a church that imprints the kingdom of God wherever we go into every sphere of life, into every fire station, police station, into every hospital, into every clinic, into every school, into every place of business, into every bar, into every restaurant, into every street, into every counseling office. Wherever we go, we imprint the kingdom of God. We imprint his joy, his justice, his love, his mercy, his hope. 
Wherever we go, we want to be a kingdom church, a kind of church that cares for the poor and the orphans and the widows and the foster, foster kids, the refugees. That's what we do when we imprint the kingdom of God. Who cares if we're a short-term influence? We want to be a long-term, eternal church that imprints the name of Jesus wherever we go. But that can only come from Jesus. And again, the crowd must have been shocked that now this man who was far from God now is living out the joy of knowing Jesus. How could this happen? How does this happen? Because the question you have to ask yourself is, how does this happen? It comes by Zacchaeus saying yes to a very simple invitation. Jesus invites him into fellowship with him not just to know about him or be around him, but to be with him. Zacchaeus, hurry, I must stay at your home today. Now in the ancient Near East, in the times of Jesus, to stay at someone's house wasn't like, okay, I'll show up at 5.30, we'll eat by six, I'll be on the road by seven. That's how we stay at people's houses here in the West. To stay meant Jesus would have been there all night. He would have slept there and the next morning got up, you read the text, he taught a little bit, then he was on his way to Jerusalem. And the whole night he's with Zacchaeus, hearing Zacchaeus, teaching with Zacchaeus. Jesus is imprinting his joy into Zacchaeus. Why does Jesus say, I'm coming to stay at your house? See, Zacchaeus thought he was inviting Jesus over or receiving the invitation of Jesus over to be a momentary guest. Jesus says, I want to be a permanent resident in your home, a permanent resident in your house. See, the reason we often don't experience the joy of Christ, if we're honest, is because we treat Jesus like a guest instead of a resident. A resident takes over. The first time I really had a resident move in was when my wife moved in after we were married. I was like, oh, she wants her stuff in every room, in every drawer, everywhere. I mean, my whole organization is just thrown out the window. She's a resident here. There's a difference between guest and resident. We want Jesus to be a guest in our home. You can stay in the foyer. But don't come in the bedroom, don't come in the kitchen, don't come past here, you stay in the foyer. Jesus, when it comes to my sexuality, I got that. When it comes to my dating, I got that. When it comes to my career, I got that. When it comes to my money, I got that. I'll give you Sundays as a guest. That was my life growing up. I'll give you Sundays, Jesus. I was the opposite of Chick-fil-A. I was only open with Jesus on Sundays. The rest of the week was on me. And as I started to read the scriptures more and walk with Jesus more, I had this sort of realization like, oh, Jesus wants every room in the house. You want to experience the joy of Christ in your life, you have to let Jesus into every room of your house. This is why it says in Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would open the door, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me. Jesus wants every room of your house. The room of your ambitions, the room of your pain, the room of your doubt, the room of your sorrow, the room of your shame, the room of your secrets, the one that no one even knows exists, the one that you lock up and you hide and you cover so that no one sees it. And Jesus says, I want in to every single room. And when Jesus walks in the room, he heals whatever is in that room and then he sets joy off in your life that you might live in the fullness of joy. This is what Jesus wants to do. He wants to set up residence with you. And some of you right now, Jesus is standing at the door of your life and he is knocking and he won't force his way in. He won't manipulate his way in. He won't coerce his way in. He won't even kick the door down. He will wait and wait and wait and patiently knock. And for some of you, Jesus is in the home and he's knocking on a different door in the room. The question is, will you let Jesus in to that room? And room by room, he'll go until he has all of you so he can imprint his joy into you. And this is what Zacchaeus does. Zacchaeus opens up his home and he receives the joy of Jesus. He is renewed in the joy of Jesus. He is restored in the joy of Jesus. And then he is released as the joy of Jesus into the city. And he practices and spreads joy wherever he goes. This is what Jesus wants to do. Jesus says in John 15, one of the most moving chapters in all of the Bible, remain in me, abide in me, stay with me. And in John chapter 15, verse 11, he says, I tell you these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full or complete. And the reason that Zacchaeus can experience this is because Zacchaeus finally learned what it means, the difference between being in proximity to Jesus and intimacy with Jesus. Zacchaeus wasn't allowed in the temple 
And the temple is where the presence of God was. And he wasn't allowed in the temple, which means he could not get near the presence of Jesus. So Jesus says, since you can't get to the presence, I'll bring the presence of God to you. And he brings to Zacchaeus the presence of Jesus. And scripture tells us in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. The reason many of you don't experience the joy of Christ all the time is because you live in proximity to God and not in intimacy with God. And if you would live in intimacy with God, in his word, in prayer, in the community, in worship, in the scriptures, practicing the way of Jesus, you would have joy unlocked in you that is not determined by what happens around you. I love what Tony Evans says here about joy, and we'll wrap up in the moment here. In speaking of John 15, 11, he describes joy this way. He says, joy is the internal stability in spite of external circumstances because of the knowledge that God is in control. It is a settled assurance, a quiet confidence in God's sovereignty that results in the decision to praise him. What that means is joy is not circumstantial, but joy is found in the posture of a heart that lives in daily fellowship with Jesus. Every day, every moment, every second, I walk in fellowship with Jesus. And that fellowship, because of Jesus, through the cross, because he resurrected from the dead, is restored and available to you. So why are we doing this as a church? Why are we trying to get a building It's because there are four million people here who are living in probably the most divided time that we've lived in in our lifetime. People are divided, people are angry, people are broken, people are lost, people are devastated, and there's no joy. You could not mark us as a people of joy, even in the church. We should be the most joyful people that the world knows because one, we know how the story ends. One, we are joyful because we know that in all things, God is going to restore and redeem and every justice will happen and God will restore all that is wrong and he will make it all right and King Jesus will come to rule and reign over all things. We know how the story ends, so we should be joyful because of that. We should also be joyful because in all things, God has been good to us. God is good to us and I have been loved by Christ. I have been brought into his mercy. His joy is available for me, not of anything I've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done, we should be the most joyful people yet even among the people of God, we are not a joyful people. And so we're doing this so the city can know, the world can know that joy is available to them, the kind of joy that may not change their circumstance, but it will change them. It will change their hearts. It will change their genetic makeup, if you will. That's why we're doing this. And so everything is sort of happening this week. This culmination is happening this week, and we're calling it Celebration Week. So we're going to fill the room on Monday and on Tuesday and on Thursday and on Friday to celebrate all that God has done to commit together as a people because this is what we want to do. We want to celebrate and be a people of joy. God is good and God is kind and joy is here. So we want to celebrate. So I want everyone, the whole church, to show up. And we have 11 days. We have 11 days to come up with all the resources we need, 2.5 million to buy and to renovate in 11 days. But I'm I'm telling you, God can do more in 11 days than we can do in 111 years. God can do infinitely more. And I just want to share some really, so get ready to clap in just a second. It's it's so exciting. I wanted to tell you up front, but then I'd be so excited I would lose my train of thought. We know we needed, by October 15th, 500,000 to close in this building. Well, a few leaders who are bought in, love what God is doing here, love this house, have already stepped up and they said, hey, you can count us in and we've tabulated what what they've given and of the 500 to close on the 15th, we already have over $300,000 committed to being able to do that. In fact, in fact, my old, my old pastor at my old church, right before I came up here, said, hey, our church is sending you 10 grand, just so you know. We're sending you 10 grand, just so you know. We want to be a part of this. And so we're going to commit. We're going to do this together because there's still a road to go. There's a boldness, a faith that we're all taking. We're going to do it together. So I want you to just close your eyes for just a moment. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. I just want you to close your eyes. I want you to imagine people in this city and across this world 
who are now living in the joy of Jesus. Look at their faces, look at their hearts, look at their lives, and imagine the joy they are experiencing. Finding hope, finding love, finding mercy, finding forgiveness in Jesus. I want you to imagine them, actually see their faces. Now ask yourself, what are we willing to commit to be a part of it? What are we willing to sacrifice to be a part of this? And my prayer for you is that you would only commit, only commit, only give, because you are responding to what Jesus is asking you to do, not by what I'm saying, because Jesus has led you to be a part of this. Now you can open your eyes. Here's the good news I wanna share with you. Everything culminates this week, it's celebration week. We called it celebration week because it's a week of joy. It's a week of knowing that God has called us into this, that God is with us in all of it, and in the end of the day, this is all for God's glory, not for our name but for the name of Jesus. And so we're gonna commit this week and we're gonna celebrate this week. And I told you, remember I said, there's 11 days for us to to close on this building. And we know that we needed $500,000 in cash to close on this building. Well, I am excited to tell you that not not even a lot of people, just a few people have said, hey, we're, we're in, we love this house, we love what God is doing. There's some of our leaders in this church that have been here from day one or even some of them just for a few months. And just with a few people, you, you better get ready to clap or say amen, make my mom proud in here in a second. Just with a few people of that 500,000 we needed to close on the 15th, we already have over 300,000 coming in already. And that's not even, that's not even talking about the commitments for two more years for the, for the other two million. This is just the beginning of what God wants to do. And the crowd around us, the city is actually skeptical. Okay. Okay, let, let, let's see if you put your money where your mouth is. Okay, let's see if you actually believe that you're going to be a kingdom outpost or is this going to just be about the building? And they're watching and they're looking. And we get to say, no, we're going to be the joy of Jesus in this city. The backpack drive that we did when there was over 200 families coming here getting backpacks and they got to choose because there's dignity and choice. It's like, here you go, kid, you're poor, take this. They got to choose what they wanted. And kids are coming in. I'm t- I wish you could have been here. Our team put this together. I wish you could have been here and seen the joy on these kids' faces, knowing that in such a dark season, such a hard year, there was a church family here, all of you who blessed them with joy. And they were all speaking Spanish. I wish I took Spanish. I took French in high school. What a useless language in Denver. I should have, you know, I was like, je voudrais un croissant, s'il vous plaît. And they're like, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. Man, I should have taken Spanish. But the joy on their faces It was incredible, and we want more of that. We're gonna do more in November, more in December. We're gonna keep being for the city and for the joy of the city and for the gospel of the city. And we get to do this because church, you all have been so generous as a church. We only get to do this because of how financially healthy we've been. We are a church that gives generously, that saves generously, and that spends really wisely. And we wanna keep that up so we could be not a bank that holds assets, but a conduit and a vessel that when God pours in, it goes out. When God pours in, it goes out. God, you give us joy, we send it out. You give us resources, we send it out. You give us grace, we send it out. And that's the kind of church we get to be a part of. That's the kind of church that says when we leave, because all of us will take our, our breath, final breath in one day, when we get to leave, we get to know that we left an imprint on this city, a kingdom of God imprint on this city, and we can look at it and say, that was a future worth sacrificing for. And I'm excited because these next 11 days, God is gonna do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine according to his purpose and his power and his joy within us. So let's open your hands. Let's pray with me.